obviously it's causing a lot of suffering, a lot of death. It's completely disrupted uh, our society, our economy. But, but from an epidemiologic point of view, it's very, very interesting. Not only because it's a brand new virus, um, the way it has spread uh, throughout the world is phenomenal. It's extremely good at spreading. But also, uh, for instance, the, the, the number of symptoms it causes is, is phenomenal, making it both uh, interesting but also difficult to study. Uh, for instance, um, not too long into the course of the outbreak, people started to notice that folks who were infected couldn't smell and they couldn't taste. And this has become one of the most important symptoms that we look for. Uh, and yet it's something that people have never thought about. I, I can't recall any other time in my career looking at a disease where something like that was one of the really important features of it. But it's the, the virus, as, it, as is so common in infectious diseases, has basically stayed a couple of steps ahead of us. We think we've, we think we've beaten it down. It flares back up as soon as we let our guard down a little bit. It's kept us uh, humble. Certainly as, a, as an epidemiologist, it's kept me humble. Uh, back in uh, late January, when the first case was reported here in Washington, I was asked a lot of times what I thought would happen with with the the outbreak and i was thinking a lot about the first stars outbreak back in the early 2000s which lasted for a year and a half and there really weren't that many cases i think there were 800 cases in the us it wasn't that big a deal and because this was this is also a coronavirus and the sars virus was in the same big family i thought it might behave the same way well clearly i was wrong and it's been one big surprise mostly bad surprise after another we well, are officially retired, but you were asked to come back into the field um, as part of the state resource team that's uh, uh, dealing with the virus here in Chelan and Douglas counties. So can you tell me a little bit about your role on that team? Well, retirement is all a relative term. Uh, I retired from the U.S. Public Health Service uh, in 2013 after uh, 28 years uh, on active duty. The last 10 of those years were with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC stationed in Seattle, working on pandemic planning, and the whole role that uh, the movement of people around the world, um, migrants, immigrants, uh, air travelers play in the spread of pandemic disease. Uh, when I finished in, again, in, in 2013, I started doing a lot of refugee work and, you know, this, that, the other thing. And when this came up, um, I thought, well, you know, I've got some skills and some knowledge that might be useful to somebody. So I called the state. Uh, Department of Health and did some work for them on personal protective equipment, PPE. And I also called the Shaline Douglas Health District because I, in the, long ago I'd done some work over here and I thought, well, you know, maybe they could, maybe they could use a hand. Uh, also, I, I feel a certain, a certain obligation to Wenatchee. Wenatchee is my hometown. Um, so many of the people in this town had a, a, a phenomenal influence on my career not only on encouraging me as I was trying to get into medical school, which is not an easy task, but also along the way, giving me, uh, you know, little suggestions, uh, uh, just a lot of help. So I, I felt a certain obligation, uh, a good obligation to uh, do some work over here. And so eventually I did, uh, I was doing volunteer work. Uh, the the uh, survey that Confluence Health and the health district did uh, I don't know, about a month and a half ago, I worked on that. And then it became clear that the health district could use uh, quite a bit more time. And the uh, state was nice enough to come up with some funding for me. So I'm, I'm here. I'm very happy to be back uh, working in my hometown. And um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great time so far. What's the nature of the work that you're doing uh, uh, with the resource team? And, and what are you seeing uh, from an epidemiological perspective locally in the two counties? What I'm doing mostly is trying to help them figure out the epidemiology of the disease. In other words, the, who's getting it, where are those people, when are they getting it, what are their symptoms, a description of how the, the, the disease is distributed in these two counties, um, and, and to get an idea mostly of how we might design control measures that are really focused on what the situation is here. And the situation here is kind of interesting. As, you're, as I think you're probably aware, there's been quite a bit of disease in the agricultural worker community. And this has been a real challenge because 
uh, many of these people uh, live in, in, uh, in basically dormitory housing, uh, very close to each other, spread is much easier. Um, and we're working on that right now. We're, 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 and for instance, we're trying to find out what's going on in some hot spots uh, with the idea of trying to control the disease in one hot spot, then move on to another hot spot and eventually uh, move in to the, the Wenatchee metro area. From a public health perspective, what aren't we doing here in the Wenatchee Valley? What haven't we adopted to control the spread that we should be doing? I mean, are there uh, safeguards that we could be better at? Where we might be, uh, where we might be lacking, where I think we've been lacking, is in going after the disease aggressively. Uh, what we've been doing so far has largely been reactive. A case, come, a case is detected somehow, we go out and investigate, um, isolate the case, quarantine the exposed people. But it's sort of been chase, a, little, a little bit like chasing our tails. And um, I think we can be a lot more aggressive, actually go out and look for people who are infected, not just wait for them to be reported to us. As far as public health uh, activities in the community go, uh, I've been really impressed by how people's behavior seems to have changed in terms of wearing masks. Oh, and, and by the way, I'm not wearing one today, but I'm in this conference room all by myself and it's pretty well ventilated. So uh, normally when I step out that door, I'll have a mask on. But you know, I've seen over the course of the last uh, month or so, uh, a lot more people in, in the community here wearing masks. Now, a place where I think we might be able to do a whole lot better is in terms of what people call social distancing, staying in what we've been recommending is uh, about six feet apart. Uh, I've seen a lot of people really close together, not wearing masks, by the way, and that's a place where I think we could do a whole lot better. One of the th obstacles I think we might run into is, is COVID fatigue. Um, yeah. People trying to deal with the outbreak, trying to do what uh, they've been asked to do, but saying, you know, look, it's been months. My business is still closed. I can't go see mom or dad in the, in the elder care home. Um, what do you think Shalane Douglas's chances are like, to turn the corner on this soon and you know, achieve those benchmarks that have been set by the state? Right. Well, you, you know, those are, <laughs> that, that's a real, the, the COVID fatigue is very real. Um, I've been talking to a number of people now recently, just friends of mine, about how tired we are of having this hanging over our heads. It's, it's now been since uh, January and people are fed up with it. I mean, we, 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 even, even if we do go ahead and get close to people around us, there's still this uh, lingering sense of perhaps of danger, perhaps of guilt. It's not quite right. And I think it's, it's been really, really pervasive in people's lives. Um, what we can do, well, right now, it, it's, it's pretty limited. But fortunately, what we can do is, is also not really terrible maintain uh, distance from, from people uh, outside your family. Six, six feet is what everybody says because that's felt to be the range of the respiratory droplets that are probably the major uh, mode of transmission of the disease from one person to another. Keeping your hands away from your face, which as I'm sure everybody knows, is way harder to do than you think it would be. People are constantly you know, scratching, scratching their head, uh, doing this, doing that. Um, keep doing that. Wear a mask. Uh, I, I, know that, I know that masks have become a big issue that's more than just a public health issue. Uh, people don't like to be told to wear masks. And the, the point I've, I've tried to make with people about masks is that they should do it, not because they're being told by the governor to do it or, or by CDC or by, by someone else. Don't do it because you've been told to do it. Do it because it's the right thing to do it. Do it because you want to protect your friends, your, your family, you know, your mother, your grandmother, uh, all these people who are important to you. It's one, of the, it's one of the most important things you can do to protect those people whom you love. And do it because, again, do it because it's the right thing to do for them, not so much because somebody tells you to do it. 